Father, we praise you and thank you for your presence in our midst. We welcome you, sweet Spirit of God. And Father, as we come before you this night, we ask that your Holy Spirit quicken our hearts, quicken our spirits, that you would teach us, you lead us, you guide us, Father God, into the depths of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, open our hearts and minds to the flow of your Spirit, that we would flow with what He wants to do, that He desires to do tonight. Let your will be done, and not ours. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Let's turn to the book of Job. The book of Job, and uh, we realize that many times when we read the book of Job, it causes questions. And well, let's read the book of Job from the back, that is from the ending, and then we go back to the front. among the poetical books. <coughs> the book of Job. And we read the last and final chapter in Job chapter 42. <coughs> Job chapter 42, verse 10. Spiritual truths are many times uh, Related to natural truths, although sometimes natural laws uh, reveal only one small aspect of spiritual truth. But uh, in the natural, you could sort of begin to understand how some things operate if you know the ending, if you know the result. Uh, like for example, uh, when Benjamin Franklin was discovering electricity, uh, he used a very dangerous form of discovery though by flying a kite in a thunderstorm and uh, so he got a shock and uh, that was electricity and uh, so from that experience uh, that he had he could work it backward and realize that uh, that whatever he experienced is definitely related to electricity that lightnings and all those that men did not understand in detail before you could, you could work it backward and realize that uh, there must be some uh, causes there. And uh, for example, when uh, one MIT graduate discovered a substance in crabs that uh, make crabs and prawns turn uh, reddish when you cook it. So for a long time, uh, nobody knows what exactly caused it. And so uh, the MIT uh, student in the States uh, Massachusetts, uh, whatever it was, uh, uh, Institute of Technology or something, one of the top schools in uh, scientific research, and uh, they make that as a project, and uh, so they work backwards. They realize that there is something that is causing it to turn red, so they work backwards, and, and uh, they say there must be some sort of chemical change uh, that is there, either chemical or physical change of some substance, and so they work backwards and they try to discover that substance. And in the end, they locate the substance. So they work backwards. Uh, and they see the results first. Now, the book of Job is the same way. If we try to understand it from the front, uh, it puzzles us because uh, uh, we wonder why did all those troubles come? After the Bible says it was that righteous, it was this. And uh, then we try to figure out how come all those things happened to him and uh, try to get a conclusion. And we ignore the most important fact that the conclusion always proves what went on before. And it explains uh, what is the previous cause of that. So let's look at chapter 42 and see how he got out of all his trouble. And, uh, and see the main key in the book of Job that he suffered all those things he suffered for less than a year. 
uh, the whole book of Job actually took less than a year. Maybe he was in that experience for six to eight months. And uh, so in that one year of experience, uh, he had all those, all those uh, conversations with his friend, and all the sickness that he went through. And uh, uh, the key is how he got out of it. And how he got out of it tells us how he got in. Right? And uh, the key in how a person comes out will be the same key that reveals and points to areas of open doors, that we can call it open doors in his life. Let's look at Job chapter 42, uh, verse 10. <clears throat> and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Bible uses the word when. And that tells us that the restoration was related to his prayer. When he prayed for his friends, then was when God restored all his blessings. And all those things that have been taken away from his life. God was pointing Job away from himself. If you remember the last week we talked about how before we move into the depths of God, that we have to die to self. We have to die to selfishness. And uh, live only for Jesus, like Paul. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who now lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And everyone who wants to have a ministry for God has to die. There is no shortcut. Before a ministry can be born, I'm not talking just about the full-time ministry, I'm talking about any ministry in the kingdom of God. Self things before God. So before we actually have a ministry, we have to die to self. And what God was doing in Job's life was pointing him away from himself and towards others. Pointing him to be concerned for others than for himself. And the principle of God in the Bible is this, that when one looks after another, they who look after the other will be taken care of by themselves. That law is operational from Genesis to Revelation. He that waters others will be watered himself. That's in the book of Proverbs. Jesus put it this way, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. There's no doubt about it that when we begin to uh, look out from ourselves and get rid of selfishness but become concerned for our neighbor, love God and love our neighbor, that, that the law of blessing starts operating in our life. And uh, so God restored Job's losses by turning him outwards to his friends. And after you have been with those friends for six or eight months, some of us may not call them friends. After all those things they said about Job, you remember those three students? One of them said, maybe you sin. Then another said, you sin. That's why this happened. And the third went further and said, uh, you are wicked. That's why this happened. And the more their conversation went, the more accusative they become. And uh, finally, uh, John has to step into the picture. After such an experience with his friends, and meanwhile, while all his friends were accusing him of all these things, Joe was suffering in pain, having a piece of uh, uh, pottery and scratching himself. With balls all over him, he was scratching himself. We do not know what he went through. Could have been the chicken box. <laughs> Or could have been some other thing, worse than that, right? Or probably worse anyway, something worse, the way the Bible describes it. And uh, all over, and he was scratching himself, and uh, all his friends accusing him of all these things. And here he has to he, he defend himself at the same time, scratch himself. While all these things were happening, God 
could only restore Job when he started praying for these so-called friends of his. Even though what they had said, in spite of what they had said, in spite of what they have accused him of, the, the real deliverance comes when he prayed for them. For many of us, we have been praying for some areas of our lives. And if you check some of those areas in your life that quote-unquote is placed under the category unanswered prayer, look for selfishness in that. A lot of prayers that are selfish never get answered until the selfishness dies. Some could be very outwardly looking very good prayers or desires. But unless selfishness dies, the power of God doesn't start operating. Job's restoration came when he prayed for others. There's another part that God dealt with him in the book of Job chapter 40 verse 3 to 5. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Says that he he literally repent before the Lord. Chapter 42, verse 6. Job says, Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Do you notice that the whole climax of the book of Job ends with the death of Job, inner selfishness or inner self-consciousness and the death of Job's inner looking and he starts looking outside of himself. Having the understanding, we see that throughout the whole book of Job, God was dealing with two main areas, his self and his inward looking. Now, having that in mind, that those are the areas that got changed before Job's situation uh, was restored. Let's look at the beginning of the book of Job. See how the story starts. Every so-called prayer that is classified as unanswered prayer or difficult prayers that don't seem to get an answer, God is waiting for us to change before the outward circumstances change. The outward circumstances will never change unless we start changing inside. Unless the inner things change, the outward things never change. We start changing on the inside. Hagen puts it this way, Whenever he pray a prayer that, that doesn't seem to, he doesn't seem to get answered, he says, he starts changing inside. And the same way of putting the same principle. The book of Job, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Blameless and upright. Blameless means as far as society is concerned, he was someone who was considered a good man. Upright, pointing to the fact that he did a lot of good things. From here we realize 
The verse in the Bible that declares all our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. See, selfishness and being self-centered can be hidden even behind good works. Can be hidden even behind an ordinary quote-unquote good action or something good classified by the world. And uh, sometimes outwardly the action looks the same, but the determination of whether that action is good or bad actually in the sight of God is more the inside. Let me give an example. For example, uh, a person comes and uh, takes a broom and uh, starts sweeping his or her house for the parents. Let's say a young person comes, takes the broom, but uh, the person did, did it, the young person is looking for pocket money. So inside, inside, that's the goal, that's the purpose. He wants to earn money. And uh, it's a situation where you know that you can uh, get some finan- extra finances by doing that and the parents uh, have sort of promised that. And so they, he did it. The same action. But his heart, his intention, his motive, all is for pocket money. What is the pocket money for? He has dreams and visions of how he will spend it. All on himself or herself. And so all those things are there. Notice that the action outwardly looks beneficial. Of course it's beneficial. It's beneficial to whosoever's house it was. And it benefits somebody. But the whole end of it, in the heart, the intention, the purpose, is for himself or herself. Pocket money to spend on themselves. Right? Another person comes. Takes the same broom. sense that appreciation for the parents has no intention of getting that finances never thought of the idea even of having some pay for that work but out of a heart of love for the parents start doing the same job now if we were to sit in that place and observe these two persons outwardly everything is equal Outwardly, everything is equal. Yet, the same action is graded on God's scale differently. One on God's scale really reaches to the heart of God. The other is just normal. The normal things that any human being would do, think about themselves. On the human scale, that waters outwardly, it's the same. Same work done, same room you, same style. So we must realize that it's the inward desire, the inward heart, the inward motive, the inward intention that places a value on whatever we do. You could do the same job somebody do and place a better, greater value. We realize that today, the strength and the value of a person's signature in the world, I'm just talking in the natural first, in the world, depends on their reputation in the world or their fat account in the bank, the power of the signature. And uh, some of those in, in uh, in the top business world, just because they have an IOU from, let's say, uh, one of these, uh, what is it, Rothschild, that will be recognized even by the bank. See, the signature carries value, and it's an ordinary piece of paper. You could take some of your rough, scribble white piece of paper that costs, you know, no more than just a few cents. Put that signature on it, and the same paper suddenly has a great value. Uh, of course, if it's another individual who scribbles his or her name, Habakkuk Te, or, you know, Tan Akau, or Rambut Tan, and signs the name, 
I know. You, you just thought such a person, right? Excuse me, your name is that. I know. So science on that piece of paper makes no value. The paper still remains uh, uh, that value of a few cents. In fact, it may be devalued because it's scribbled on it. So you realize it's not just the exact thing, uh, the, the material, the molecules or the atoms that consist of material, but it's the value that human beings put on that. In God's realm, the value He puts on, on the actions we do, we realize that the Bible says every Christian will be judged. Do you realize every Christian will be judged? There is such a thing as a believer's judgment. We are not here to preach fire and brimstone and frighten you until you obey God. <laughs> However, the judgment has nothing to do with our salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation. We are not going to be judged whether we are going to be saved or not. That's already uh, determined in Christ. We are saved by His grace. Yet, why does God judge believers? The purpose is for reward. See, God has to put a value on our life, on our actions in order to reward us, in order to be the just God that He is. He has to reward according to His system. And what we are emphasizing here tonight is that He's going to judge our actions. Our actions will be judged. The Bible calls it our works will be judged. They will be judged before God. Every one of our actions, every one of our works, whatever form they be, that the world classifies as work. The life we live, the things we do, everything will be judged. The works we do. And uh, since we are on that, let's look at the book of Corinthians. Look at the believer's judgment for a while. See, many times we have to be motivated by the scripture in order to be selfless. And uh, once you see the value of being selfless, Let's read the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, that is our action, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says, we, which includes himself, and all Christians, all believers, all in the Bible ministry, all those in the various other type of nine ministries of believers, will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And since we are all going to be there, it will be wise for us to prepare for that examination. If any one of us today face an important examination, whether you're sitting for your SRP, SPM, your HSA, or your degree course, your diploma course, your PhDs and your doctorate, and uh, whatever course, or law, courses of accountancy, courses of law, or, or all these things, we prepare for them. We prepare for them in the sense that if you're going to sit for an accountancy exam, you don't turn around and study biology. And then sit for an accountancy exam. No, you would study and prepare relevantly as much as possible the areas that you, you expect the questions to be in. In the same manner, if we do that in the natural, how much more the eternal thing? We have one fine day, we are all going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, where He's going to call all of us one by one by name. Say, brother, it's public judgment, yes sir. It's public reward. And uh, 
So when he calls all of us one by one and rewards, that's why it took so long. To reward all of us. It's not to determine whether we are saved or not saved. We are all saved. But it's to determine reward. And we need to understand God's system of value. If we understand God's system of value, we can have more rewards. We could place a greater value on the things God values. If we value what God doesn't value, we will be foolish. If we value what God values, then we would be what the Bible calls wise in the sight of God. And this is what God values. Every action that we do in life, every deed that we do in life, whether they have an added value before God or not, is determined by the motivation. And the more selfless it is, the higher the value of the act. And we realize these are not things that the world plays a high value on. But God does. Every sacrifice you make in your life, the others may be blessed. Every kind word you spoke out of a selfless heart, the others may be lifted up. Every kind deed you do out of a heart that is selfless, not even thinking of anything of self, has a great high value on the judgment day. Wow. While we are meditating on that, we need to look at First Corinthians 13. First Corinthians thirteen says in verse three, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, wow, isn't that very sacrificial? But have not love. You say what? It. It what? Say that word again. It profits me kosong. Nothing. Now think a bit for a moment. If you sell everything you have and give away, don't you think somebody else profits? Of course. <laughs> it's not talking about somebody else profiting. But you don't profit. The holy day of my brother. Yes. What is the definition of love in First Corinthians 13? After all the definition, you could summarize it this way. Love is complete death of self. It's pure, full, benevolent thought and concern for others. That's the purity of God's love. For God so loved the world that He kept His Son. Never. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And mind you, that was His best. Jesus loved us and He gave His life. And we are followers of that same Jesus Christ who walked the shores of Galilee. That Jesus comes not only to change our actions. He's not just coming so that we don't smoke, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> Although those will come. But Jesus came to teach us a higher motive for living. A higher motive for action. He comes not only to change our action, He comes to change the very motivation of our action. The intention. That is why He tells us to do things that is beyond even the Old Testament command. He says in the Old Testament, He says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a leg for a leg. But in the New Covenant, he says, bless those who revile you. Do good to those who do evil. That's a remarkable law. 
See, Jesus comes to change our inner being until we are just completely selfless. And it's when He succeeds in changing our very inborn nature of being selfish. One of the first things little children do is learn to be selfish. If you get a little child and you show two apples, one big apple, one small apple, choose. No more to teach them. Straight away they go for the big one. That is a manifestation of the sin nature. People ask, what exactly is sin nature? What, what, what is sin nature? Sin nature is simply the tendencies to be selfish that is ingrained and inborn in all of humanity. Started from Adam. So Jesus came to completely bring us to the point of being what he called contrite. A contriteness where our selfishness dies and we live. As Paul says, we are we have been crucified. And it's no longer I, it says, but Christ. Who live, transform life. When we do that, the value of our action is tremendous. In First Corinthians thirteen, notice the problem of putting a value on the act of bestowing goods to the poor or giving our body to be burned. It has no value. Although on this earth it has a value. It has no value until the correct intentions are placed. The correct intentions are in place. Paul says, it has no profit. In what respect? It has no profit in the judgment day of Christ. It's not even considered. So then does it mean it's wasted? Yes, it is wasted. Because the intention was not there. It was not for a selfless reason. It was for a selfish reason. Marvelous to think of the high standards of God. But as we realize God's system, we could begin to put a value on our actions. The actions and the deeds that we do that are the highest value are those that flow out of selflessness. How does that tie back to prayer? Every time a prayer is answered, it must always be placed in the right perspective where we die to self-will and live for God's will. That is why in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 Jesus teaches us to pray saying Father who art in heaven hallowed be your name thy kingdom come thy will be done his will, His kingdom. And the purpose of prayer is fully to do His will. His perfect will. Some people misunderstand God. Say, why is God that way? But hold it, hold it, don't misunderstand God. Say, why is God always wanting His will, His will? Hold it there. God is so big then the more powerful telescope they make, the more galaxies they discover, and God is bigger than that. We haven't even seen the ages of one galaxy. 
and we see glimpses of other galaxies and there are millions and millions of galaxies in this world and that mighty God of ours made it. Here we are one speck on this small tiny solar system that is one tiny little corner of the galaxy and on the tiny corner of the galaxy there are many many stars and there is one sun, our sun with those planets revolving around the sun, the solar system and on that solar system one tiny little planet there and on that tiny little planet is that spot of dust called you and they are saying I know my way better than God I know my will no the one who made us made a will and a plan and his plan involves our best good It's just like if human beings today invent a machine or they invent a washing machine or they invent a, a car they will put for best results do it at this and that and this they give all the rules that is the manufacturer's wheel the best that your car will run by you could take your car run it like a mad man drive like Jehu in the Bible and uh, just you know speed and accelerate and simply change gear all over this place you could say I like it that way my way why should I follow the manufacturer because he made it so he knows the best way when God made man he made man in such a way and he knows what is best for us. Like for example, we can choose to have unforgiveness, but unforgiveness kills us. Gives us ulcer, gives us all kind of sickness, right? Why? Because God knows that it's not good for us. So everything that every law, remember, every law that God made has a benefit for us. The law was not made to make us miserable. The Ten Commandments, all the thou shall not, were not given so that thou shall not have fun. But the Ten Commandments were given that we would be enjoy the best enjoyment possible. Think about some of the commandments of God. Thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not steal. Think about people who break the commandment, they steal, they kill, they destroy. They have no peace. They get into sickness. They get into all kinds of problems. They don't really enjoy life anymore. So when God made that plan, God gave His will. And this is a marvelous thing about God. Every time He reveals His will, it is the maximum enjoyment possible out of this life He has given. If we follow His will all the time, His will gives us maximum enjoyment in this life the maximum enjoyment possible is, does not diminish it maximizes and that is why when God gives his laws he wants us to pray your will be done first for in doing his will the best that is for us starts taking place. And in all those answers to prayer, when we pray, God starts dealing. The first thing God starts dealing is with ourselves. With ourselves. Let's look at one person's prayer before we go back to Job. In the book of First Samuel, First Samuel and while you're turning to First Samuel let me tell you selfishness is very subtle it can creep in under any kind of pretense it can even cloak itself under religiosity and come in don't think that selfishness is just a guy down on the street who is just killing and robbing it includes that no doubt 
selfishness can be cloaked under religiosity. Selfishness can come in, even in a ministry. My kingdom, my ministry, my church, my sheep. <laughs> Do you know the my, my, I points to selfishness? Selfishness can creep into a relationship. Don't touch my chair, my sofa, my property. That's my book you're holding. It's strange how subtle selfishness can come under all manner. And sometimes as parents, we must watch it all the time when we begin training children. What kind of attitude are we giving to children? You now sometimes, if all we're thinking is, you know, the best, every natural parent will want to give the best to their children. But we forget to teach the children to be selfless. We haven't taught them anything. We have only made them very selfish and spoiled. And most children grow up very selfish. So how do we overturn that? From small, we must keep emphasizing to them. It's more blessed to give than to receive. They have to be trained. We have to turn their original sin nature inside. And we have to keep training them. Give, give, give. Surrender, surrender, surrender. Do good. Think of others. Don't think of yourself. It's a long time. And in the same way, that's why the prayer of dedication is so important. Of all prayers, if you put on, the, there are many types of prayer. There's a prayer of dedication, there's a prayer of intercession, there's a prayer of faith, etc. But the prayer of dedication is your first gear. If you don't engage that first gear, you spoil the whole engine. You try driving your car every time with fourth gear, from beginning to end. <laughs> no doubt if you get, have a powerful enough energy, it will just go along, go along, go along, but one day the whole engine will come out. Now you have to study off on first gear, and get the power going. And then as it starts moving, it starts pushing the car. Now the car has less, uh, less, less energy is needed to push it. Then you change to the second gear. In prayer, your first gear is the prayer of dedication. Prayer of dedication. That's powerful. Prayer of dedication. So after prayer of dedication, what is the next prayer I must learn? A prayer of faith. If you don't have faith and you don't understand faith, all the other things cannot work. If you cannot have faith for yourself, you cannot have faith for others. Don't think about interceding for others if you cannot succeed in praying for yourself. Faith. Prayer of faith. Second year. Then we begin to launch into all the other realms of prayer. And in the prayer life, there's more than just four or five years. There are many inside. Many different realms. Uh, what we are emphasizing is how important to always move into selflessness and the dying of self. You all have seen the first Samuel by now, right? First Samuel, we haven't forgotten that yet. And I haven't forgotten Job yet. I'm just uh, twirling a truth and uh, leading a tour to the Bible. First Samuel, chapter 1. In verse 6 and 7, And her rival, this is Hannah, let's read verse 5 too. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had allowed her womb to be closed. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. See, every year Hannah goes up and she was sad. Every year she sad. Every year she comes back with a long, long face. The longest papaya in the world. Every year. And her husband sees her and he loves her so much. And he sees her so sad. One day the husband says in verse 8, 
Am I not better to you than ten sons? Of course it's right. But it still never made her happy. She wanted a son. Now guess what she was crying for, for those years. In verse 8, uh, verse 7. Year after year she cried. Why did she cry? Because she wanted a son. She wanted children. I'm sure she's not just crying for no reason. She's crying because she wanted a son, she couldn't have any children, and the other woman was tormenting her. She wept year in, year out, year in, year out. We do not know how long, but it was very long. And the Bible tells us, in verse 10, she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. But her tea came when she died. When she was totally broken and contrite and she died to her own self. And she said, Lord, you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. All I want is just an experience of having the son. I don't want the son, I just want the experience. I'll give the son back to you. What was she doing? You know, I believe that's the first time she thought about the Lord in her situation. What about all the other years? In all the other years, she only thought about herself, her need, herself, her need. When she thought about the Lord, then there was an answer. Incidentally, you cannot outgive God. We cannot outsmart Him, no doubt. But you cannot also outgive Him. When Hannah surrendered that one first child she had, the Lord blessed her with many other children. You can read the story on. See, God, God is a selfless God. And if you walk with God and you know God well enough, you never can outgive him. The more you give, the more he gives. That's why Jesus told the disciples in Mark chapter 10. After the rich man left, you remember the rich man? Who says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus took one look at him and said, one thing thou lackest, go and sell all you have and give to the poor. See, all the man's life he had built for himself. When the Lord said, one thing you still left, he did not die yet to sell. That would mean dying to everything he had. Jesus come and follow him, and he could not. And he turned and he walked sadly away in Mark chapter 10. Then Peter, who was listening to the whole conversation, said, Lord, what about us? We have given all and followed you. True enough, they have given up their fishing profession. They have given up their Peter, James and John and Andrew fisheries. They have given up all those. They were partners together. Now they are following the Lord Jesus. And the Lord said this statement. He says that no one has left mother, father, wife, husband, land. And follow me. Who has not received a hundredfold. In this life, in this life, and in the life to come. And many Christians are today claiming the hundredfold. Some claim a thousandfold. Think very carefully. Let's be realistic. If a Christian and every Christian actually get a hundredfold, do you realize how much we're getting? One dollar you give is hundred dollars. Ten dollars is one thousand. Hundred dollars. 10,000. 
thousand dollars, it's a hundred thousand. Ten thousand is million. That means all you have to do give ten thousand, you get a million, then you put it in the bank the rest of the time, no need to believe God. Put it in fixed deposit. <laughs> Leave off the interest. See, why doesn't God give the hundredfold? It's not God's problem. And a lot of Christians think they're getting hundredfold, they are not. Because a hundredfold is not an unconditional promise, it's a conditional promise. You see, how much we actually get when we give depends on how surrender it is inside. That's remarkable. Again, I emphasize, the value God places on the giving is more what happens in the heart than what happens in the hand and in the purse. So the return you receive when you have an offering, offering and in the offering time in a meeting, it's not just what you put inside that determine what you get. It is what is going on in the heart at the moment when you are putting it inside. So two persons can put in a hundred dollars. But in one person's heart is thinking, uh, his heart is half surrendered. Fifty percent dead, fifty percent still seeking alive. He will get a certain return. Another person has died to sell seventy percent. That person will reach 70% possibility. See, how much a person get depends on two areas. The faith level, the amount given, and the deadness to sell. Three level actually. If you include the amount given. So it's proportional. It's controlled in that way. And the amount given of course determines the law of sowing reaping in the vessel. Give and you shall be given the good measure press on second to get a running over shall make you under your bosom. Or the same measure you use. Right? So the amount is also one determined factor. There are some people who are only learning to give one dollar, two dollar, three dollar, four dollar, who are believing God for a million dollars. They are using a teaspoon giving and believing God for a whole uh, you know those container Truck <laughs> to come back. It does not work that way. Don't don't reach beyond your faith level. If you are using teaspoon level, go at the teaspoon level of faith. Exercise your faith. And usually, if your giving is in the one dollar, two dollar, you are receiving probably in the same way. Five, ten, you no know, dollar. Then when you're giving and larger to 100 or 200, you're receiving, also usually comes in the same. By the time your giving can stretch to a thousand dollars, then you're touching receiving thousands of dollars. So it's proportionate. The same measure you're using is the same measure you can receive back. So it's determined by the faith level, no doubt, uh, by the amount given. The second is determined by the faith level. The faith level is how much faith we exercise. The amount of faith they exercise as we release an offering. It's important. Some people don't develop their faith, they just in doubt all the time. Oh, I don't know, I just give. Lah. I'm not sure, and I, I never get blessed, and they never get blessed. I don't know, it never works. Right? They, their mouth is not controlled. Confession, they have not learned. Visualizing, they have not learned. Meditation, they have not learned. No faith development. Faith is. Like Jesus said, that one is really of tiny faith. Tiny faith means tinier than mustard seed. It is, you know, today we would call it molecule faith. One molecule. Even the electron microscope has difficulty looking at it. And so, the faith level determines. But another important factor is the amount of selflessness. It determines the power of multiplication. Wow! Why do some receive 64, some 34? How selfless it is. And with all these factors affecting, we realize that if somebody gives $10, 
and the person is totally surrendered. Oh, I mean, the person's life is surrendered to God. Day and night, the person is a worshiper of God. And everything the person does, the person thinks about God. God first. Jesus first. He is number one. The person puts in ten dollars, two hundred, full come back. Then another person, half, half, half surrendered, half my time, mine, half my time, you know, you know, a little bit, ten percent of my time in this regard. The rest are my time. God, don't touch it. Person puts in ten dollars. Gets back. Eleven dollars. Say, hey, why you want different for mine? The amount of surrender. And this principle is espoused in uh, Mark chapter 10. My first turn to that. Mark chapter 10. Verse 29. Assuredly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecution. Don't forget that. And in the age to come, eternal life. Notice he says, now in this time. And in the age to come. Many people try to claim Mark 10 verse 30, but they don't do Mark 10 verse 29. Now, by Mark 10 verse 29, I don't mean that you suddenly go home, throw your parents and fathers out, <laughs> or literally left them and become like what Paul called an infidel who doesn't take care of their own family. It's talking about a surrendered heart. You know what it is to surrender to God? It's tremendous. My wife can tell you the price she paid because she's married to me. They don't have as much time. And when I'm ministering, put it this way, I consecrate myself to God. No funny business. And uh, I'm not sure whether I should share so many personal things or not. Maybe it's overnight, right? You can share a little bit closer. Is it yes or no? Oh, okay. And, uh, so, if I miss spring, doesn't matter, even if I miss me a whole month, I stay away from my wife. I mean, we stay together, but we don't have physical relationship at all. Nothing wrong with that, but it's my consecration to God. Have you not read in First Corinthians 7 of the sexual Fast. Of course, don't try to be super spiritual if you're married, your husband and wife. You come to them and say, I'm going on a year of sexual fast. And uh, you must have consent. Thank God I married a woman who understands God. And she understands my consecration and she loves God more than she loves me, which I like it. So she would understand the price that is to be paid. And uh, many times when, when God, I'm sure some of you who are called to the other types of ministry, God called me to a different type of ministry, some of you could be called to just evangelist or maybe prophet. <laughs> and then God has to send you out six months a year. If you're married, it's going to be hard. I remember Kenneth Hagin, how he went out so often because he's called to be a prophet teacher. And one day the wife starts complaining to God. I don't see my husband that often. Hagin nearly died. And when he came back one day, he, was, he had no more heartbeat, but he was walking around. That was when he really knew that you live by the spirit man. His heart stopped and there was a minister next to him and he said, come, feel my heart, you feel and there was nothing and the minister started crying 
behavior just lying down for a moment. You see a life talking. And then God started dealing with the wife. Do you want me to take him home or do you want to keep him? My wife said, Lord, I'd rather keep him and not see him that often than you take him home now. The Lord said, Alright, then you can have him. And his heart started beating again. And Hagin says that many times when he drives out of his car port, and the tears will run down his eyes and says, God, I'm doing this because I love you. He put God above everything. Now, we're not saying that when you put God first, you neglect your family. Please be balanced. But we are talking of an element of sacrifice that is appreciated by God. That is required, that is needed when we want to serve God. We realize that sometimes people put a pyramid system. God first, family second, and uh, church third, and uh, then other, other things, right? And uh, people have that pyramid system. But I believe that the picture is more a circle. God in the center, and then on one circumstance, you have family, you have ministry, you have a church, or you have your work, and whatever area. It all revolves around the circle. It's not a pyramid system, where all the time, you would say, you know, always in all areas, you know, uh, this is first, second, third, fourth. There's an element of truth inside, but remember, that is not all of the truth, it's one facet. We need to combine it with the picture of a circle with all those things and circumference and put it this way. Sometimes God knows that in certain lives the family is placing too much importance and He wants them to take certain time to show their consecration to Him. See, so God, God starts dealing in that area. And sometimes God knows that a person is putting ministry above their fellowship with God and God starts dealing with that area. So it's more a circle. The pyramid system has a, an element of truth and no doubt about that. In the sense that in a qualification of elders and deacons, if you cannot show a good testimony in your family, how can then you hate the church of God? So there is the truth of God, which is true. And the other fact we forget is God's testing. It may require you to show that you put God first above family, above anything, for a small period of time. If you can do that with Abraham for one incident, that shows us that he may require of us for certain periods of time to show we put him first. Otherwise, why then does the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 say that even for married couples, that from time to time they can come, they can agree and consent to separate for a while for prayer and fasting. Do you notice that? Then the Bible says, but let Satan send them, let them come together again. He is not advocating that the married leaves are married, but he is advocating that one show a consecration to God. God is first. God does not test, and today I don't believe he ever does that again, test us by asking us by Abraham to... Uh, offer up your son and take a knife and say, God! <laughs> because that was a special incident God wanted to prophesy about the coming of his son. See, Abraham represents God the Father. Isaac represents God the Son. And so that was a prophetic way that God was pointing to Jesus Christ coming, one day laying his life for us. But the principle of God proving us is still there. I believe when the disciples were with Jesus for those three years, they were much away from their home and family. But it was not a permanent thing. Later we read in the book of 1 Corinthians how Paul was saying that Peter used to pull his wife everywhere he goes. Right? But what about those three years? Do you think Peter pulled his wife around? I think they hardly had time. Don't you think so? 
three years. Or you don't think so. <laughs> but, the theological emphasis seems to show that during those three years Peter spent with Jesus, he hardly had time in his home. But it was not a permanent period. Remember, God does not, don't mistake me, don't jump to the extreme. God does not, does not strain family relationships. The key word is the word consent. Remember that. So if ever you have a husband-wife relationship and uh, one side have a vision from God, the other side cannot see, you have, you got no side, you got to wait for the other side. You don't be a push off. Say, I don't care about you, you do what you want, do or die, I'm going to serve God. <laughs> no, we, we always advise, and this we believe, like Paul say, you know, and uh, this uh, we, don't, we believe is the, is the best advice, that when one party wants to serve God or has a certain direction from God, if it's of God, you would be able to wait for the other to see it also. Right? You don't be a push off. Right? And think that you're serving God and you're very heroic. Yes, very heroic, fostering your family. But on the other hand, the key word is consent. If both of them could live to the mature level and walk with God, God is number one in their life. Then, God is number one in their life. Then, they would be able to live at a high level of consecration. But for some short period, like for example, you're going on a 40 day fast. See, it's, it's what I'm not talking about. Uh, 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 things that are done every day. Nobody goes on a 40 day fast every day. If you do that, then you don't eat every day. The rest of your life. But I'm talking about short years. Like Peter may have his uh, uh, three years with Jesus. But I'm sure he hardly sees why. I don't think every day, say, Jesus, can I have my usual four hours with my wife today? No, he just follow Jesus around. His eyes popping out all the time. Seeing the wonderful things. But after the three years are over, you could go back. No problem. I'm sure he has a very understanding wife. And uh, she must have, otherwise you will find something about her. <laughs> and uh, she must have been. What about Moses? Imagine the amount of time he was separated from his family. I'm sure when he was going on those 40 days fast, that... He was not living his wife as normal. See, there's a great demand of consecration. If you remember how when the Lord told them, it was the first time the Lord met them on the Mount, on the Mount, Mount Sinai, the Lord said, let no man come near their wife. You remember that statement? You forget then, I'm going to turn to them. See, God demands certain consecration. He doesn't demand it all the time. Now, it will be wrong for you to go without C-O-N-S-E-N-T, consent from both. But if they could understand the ways of the Lord in consecration, that's why we talk about dedication and dying to self, you could reach a very high level of God's blessing. And Gordon Lindsay says this in his book, uh, and Mrs. Freda, Gordon Lin- Freda Lindsay said that in the book, Diary Secrets, she says, and Lindsay also said in his book, uh, the Golden Ministry story in his autobiography. Whenever there is great consecration given to God, like for example in his family, he gives so much time to the Lord, he doesn't have as much time with the family, that he found that God gives extra to the family. God seems to give them special gifts, special endowments, special grace that that he seems to show his appreciation for the, for the time that he has taken one out of the family to use in a certain way. That uh, God seems to bless the children with an extra blessing of talent, of grace, of areas. That he shows his appreciation. Again I repeat, you never can outgive God. You never out can outgive God. God always outgives us. One thing for sure, Mark 10 verse 30 is based on Mark 10 verse 29. So there are a lot of foolish Christians outside claiming hundredfold. 
when their heart is surrendered only tenfold. Let's not mock God or the scriptures. It's conditional promise. But this is a wonderful news. The surrender of our heart can be made through the prayer of dedication and to spending time with God. See, it's not something unchangeable. It's something changeable. We can change our heart to be a heart that surrenders 100%. We can change our attitudes to be an attitude of surrender 100%. And what a wonderful blessing we begin to tap on. We begin to tap on the power of the hundredfold. Wow! How many here want the power of the hundredfold? Amen. We can tap on that. The fact is, surrender to God is a choice we make. Not something that circumstances that force us to surrender. Surrender to God is something that we can make by a choice. Which we can. And that is why when God deals in, in Hannah's life, she never receives until she dies to herself. And everywhere, you see, wherever someone starts sincerely with all their heart thinking about God, he never outgave God. Imagine David. He says, I want to build God a house. And, Na- and uh, what Nathan prophet says, Go ahead. It's good. Good idea. It's changed your heart. Then God has to say, No, no, not, not you. Your son. But then God didn't just say that. God said, Because you thought of building me a house, I will establish your kingdom and your family. God said that. If you read the story of David, as David said, said before the Lord, the, the prophecy came back to him. See, when he wanted to build God's house, God turned around and said, I will build your house. He hasn't even started the house. He, in fact, he was forbidden to build a house. But his intention was there. His heart was pure. 100% sincere, pure. Because it was there, God said, God knew. He meant it. He really wanted to do it. God says, I'll be your house. I'll establish your throne. i establish your house. You never outgive God. Learn the secret of dying. There's power in the surrendered life with God. There's power in a life that is totally surrendered to God. Power that the world cannot comprehend. That's why Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. There's tremendous power when we die totally to self. In the book of Job, as we start off, having understood that, See, the problem in Job's life was not his blamelessness or his uprightness. You could be outwardly blameless and upright in society and be a very selfish man. See, the world doesn't recognize selfishness like the Bible recognizes selfishness that God recognized. Remember that book, uh, Demons and Eyewitness by Howard Pickman? He was a reasonably good Christian, he mentioned. He did some witnessing work every week. He worked a living, but all, all you're thinking of his own living. Let me tell you, the average Christian is thinking about themselves and their living. Ming Wiggers' word says, making a living is not something Christians should even worry about. But it's living for God. That if we would think about that, God would take care of the rest. It says, if all our goal is, is to just make a living, it's the lowliest goal anybody ever set. Yet in the world, it's a very high goal. Now, I'm not saying you should not have goals in that area or proper planning of your life. I'm not saying that. But whether that's a goal, it is 
covered by other goals that are more important. For me personally, the most important thing in my life is to do God's will. It's not even to do the ministry. I'm not interested even. Even I told some of the Singaporeans, say, if God didn't ask me to come, I wouldn't want to come. I, I don't desire to come. It's too, I realize it's too great a work to do down there. But I want to only obey God. Wherever He sends, I go. Wherever He calls, I follow. And that's the, the, the greatest desire of my heart, just to do God's will. I'm not even interested in, 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 in doing some sort of ministry thing. If all God called me to do is just to work in 24 hours, I will enjoy that. If I enjoy that the best. To do His will is number one. But to be a disciplined person, when God tells you to do something and He gives you a task, you have to have goals. You have to set goals. You have to set vision. Right? So that we could discipline this life of ours. Discipline the mind of ours. That we would have something to progress towards. See, we are not talking about getting rid of goal setting or, or for example, if you're working hard as a student out there studying or working at a job that you, you know, ting tai, ting tai, you go to your office, ting tai, ting tai, say, my job is not important. More important, read the Bible. So your boss employ you to do accounts. You go there, open the Bible. I'm spiritual, you know, and, and, and uh, you don't give your honest day's work to them, which I think is is a bad testimony. So we're not talking about having the attitude. Don't run to that extreme either. But we are talking, however, that that can be set as a goal to build your discipline inside. But that is not the main goal. The main goal. The highest goal in our lives is thy will be done and not our. Is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is done in heaven. So in the book of Job, Job was upright, he was blameless, he had a lot of blessings. But here is where I want to point to Job's self consciousness. Alright? Not running him down, but based on what I've shown earlier in the last chapter forty two. There is the self consciousness that must be read of a life. You notice this in verse four. His sons will go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day and will send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Then, in verse 5, Job, Job will stand and sanctify them. He will rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Job said, It may be that my sons have seen and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. The first thing is Job focused on the negative, not on the positive. He is right in doing that, but he focused on the negative. Let me give an example. For example, if... Uh, uh, let's say if a person is a song leader, leading a song, and you realize that they make mistakes, so you come and say, you make this mistake, you make that mistake, you focus on the negative, you don't change them. You never change people by focusing on the negative. In fact, you make them angry. You aggravate them. Now what you say could be correct. But, the emphasis is wrong. There's something wrong in that. Is Remember that story I told about the beautiful musician with a lovely nightingale's voice who got married to another musician and that musician was perfectionist every time she sang he would say I think you missed that chord and that note here and there at first she sang with such freedom and liberty nightingale like an angel but every time she goes home after he ma she married him he was a perfectionist. He would comment on her. This is very wrong. This is very wrong. This is very wrong. This is very wrong. After many months, she continued her singing ministry. And people began to notice her voice is now different. There seems to be a strain. She seems to be trying to strain herself to reach somewhere. 
After many years of singing, many years of that marriage life with that musician, she she is so nervous. Every time she stands up to sing, she's so nervous. What will he say next? Her voice starts cracking. She doesn't sound like Nightingale anymore. She sounds like the Clank Crow. And uh, so she stopped. She had to stop her music ministry. And one day, the husband died. The musician husband died. Many years passed by, she met a salesman and fell in love with him. She remarried. The salesman was a super salesman. He was Mr. Positive. One day he discovered she could sing, which he never knew. He didn't tell him. Or once opened, then he didn't. And then he hear her saying, I didn't know you could sing. One birthday party he heard her sing. That's nice. Sing that again. She sang again. That's wonderful. I haven't heard such a voice. And sing again. And, and every night he come over and say, Dear, would you like to sing me a song? And every time she says, what a beautiful voice you have. Nightingale. And so one day, there's an opportunity in the church and say, why don't you go and sing? He said, no, 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 cannot, cannot. But being a salesman, he says, you can do it. You can do it. And uh, finally, got her there. She sang. And when she finished, he would say, Wonderful! He did it well! And after many months, people began to see the liberty coming up from her life. And slowly, slowly through the years, she developed her singing ministry again. I'm not suggesting that you pray for your loved ones to die. <laughs> but, the principle is, the principle is, the power of accentuating the positive in another person changes them more than you accentuate the negative. Many people who are critical have good intention. They want to try to change the person. But they are like the person who has a good intention using wrong methods. And you know there are many people sitting in jail today who have good intention but use wrong methods. They think they are Robin Hood. But all Robin Hoods will be jailed. <laughs> they are outlaws. And anyway, your name is not Robin, neither are you a hood. <laughs> but even today, some psychologists, pediatricians discover the impact and the ability to change children growing up is greater if you accentuate the positive than you accentuate the negative. You don't believe me, you go and test it on children. When you do, they do something right, you begin to pay attention to it and say, that's wonderful, you did it right. It encourages and boosts them, it's like putting a booster on them to keep doing the right thing. Uh, most parents are the opposite. When they do the wrong thing, all the attention comes. Why you do all this thing? Wow, wow, wow. And they give them about half an hour undivided angry attention. <laughs> but when they do something right, there's nothing. Silence in heaven. So as a result, the child goes up nervous. You know, frightened of doing the wrong thing. And he never actually changed the child. So today they discover what the Bible says is correct all the time. Confession is possession. You confess into the person what you want. That's the best way of changing. Sowing. And so here Job, he focuses on the negative. He did it regularly. But do you notice something? It was his family. His son. His family. And as time goes on, things happen. No doubt he was very noble, but I can never understand his wife. When things happen, 
His wife said in uh, Job chapter 2 verse 9 Do you still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die! I never understand how Job could ever get angry with that wife. <laughs> and uh, what a wife! <laughs> Here is a man down lost his kids, lost his flock, lost his farm, lost everything, and uh, fell sick. Why comes with a word of encouragement? Curse God and die, and it will all be over. What a wife. And uh, he said, you speak as one of those foolish women in verse 10. And uh, I mind his attitude. But do you notice that in his conversation in chapter 3, right on to chapter 40, the main gist, we don't have time to go in the book of Job, but if you want to have a look at that, there's more details study in the Bible study course that we have panorama in the book of Job. We went into some details. That every time Job said something, his self-consciousness come out. You look at verse chapter 3, verse 3. May the day perish on which I was born. Verse 11. Why did I not die? Why did I not perish? When I came from the womb. Verse 12. Why did the knees receive me? Why the breast that I, I should nurse? For now I would have lain still. I, I, I. Uh, the consciousness of the I. One of the strangest things that we note when there's a healing anointing going on is this. Is that when there's a powerful healing anointing, those who get most blessed are those who think least of themselves. Example, sometimes there's a healing anointing and some, a sick person is there wanting to be healed. Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Oh, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Sadly, they don't get healed. There are thousands of reasons we don't want to simplify it, but I'm just stating the fact. Powerful anointing. Another person in another corner, same room, same auditorium, healing anointing going on. A person look around and begin to feel, my sickness is not as bad as all the others. I mean, wow, well, look at the others. What need they have. And the person starts thinking about others, starts praying for others. Suddenly the power of God goes to them, they got healed. There are many such cases of healing in Captain Kuhlman's ministry. When the people stop thinking about themselves and start thinking about others or about God, most important is to think about God. They sort of open their spirits up to the power of God they say. And the one big blockage of God's power is the big eye, the self. That is why when there's a healing anointing, if we could get people to think more about God, think about others, it's easier to get them healed. Then if a sick person is conscious of themselves, that's why if a person is sick, one of the first things you have to do is not attend a TV party. Is to get the person to think outside of themselves. Worship God or something. It would put them in a better position. Now that's not the only key, but that's one of the, 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 the keys involved. It will put them in a better position to receive the anointing that comes. When they're just outward looking instead of inward looking. I look at Job. He looks inside all the time. And then when all his friends say anything, he got a good defense. He has a good defense. And in the end, God himself had to speak. And Job said, I will cover my mouth. I know not what I say. But one thing Job realized, that he has to repent. What did he repent? He was righteous, but also self-righteous. It's strange. 
You could be righteous and then become self-righteous. You could be righteous and then become self-righteous. Self-righteous is that you know you are righteous yourself. Humility is not humility if you are still conscious of it. Humility is really humility you are not even conscious about it. See, if you are conscious about it, see, you got a small percentage of self that is conscious. The one thing I admire about Moses is when he came down from the mountain, the Bible says Moses didn't even know his face was shining. Do you know the Bible said that? He was not aware of that. In the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 29, So it was, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face was shining. He was so lost in the presence of God. He was so dead to self. And I could imagine what was in his heart, in his mind, in his spirit. I, I could sort of lovely sense what he was. He was just all struck at God. And as he came down, he was just thinking about God. He had seen the back part of God's glory. See, he is totally tied, no consciousness of himself. And he came down under such an awesome yieldedness. God's glory shone through his life. His face shone and yet he doesn't know. How different from others who try to be like Moses and if one square inch of the face shines, say, hey, look here, this is a sign that God is with me. And Moses had his whole face shining and he didn't even say this is a sign. We don't have to. If people are to say that, they're still not dead. When we are completely dead, we are also dead to self-consciousness. We become God-conscious. We are only thinking about God. 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 And we should develop it in such a way that every time our mind is free, the thought that arises is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. That is when we are completely dead. And Christ lives in us fully. And I close with just reading this verse in Isaiah chapter 64. We come before God in prayer tonight. How marvelous to learn to pray for others tonight as you hold in your hands the prayer request of others. So wonderful to be able to die to stand and pray for others. And you don't lose out even tonight. Why? Because you cannot outgive God. The more you give of yourself and die to self, to care for others, to love others, to do God's will for others, the more He blesses you. We can never outgive God. Never. In a natural we think we'll be neglected when we keep giving to others. We never. Never can I give God. Isaiah 64 and uh, we read verse 4 For since the beginning of the world men have not heard nor perceived by ear by the ear nor has the eye seen any God besides you, who acts for the one who waits for him. Also, Isaiah 66, verse 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, earth is my foot too. Where is the house that you will build me? Where is the place of my rest for all these things, all those things 
my hand has made and all those things exist says the Lord but on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word what is a contrite spirit? one who has died to self some people use it one who has been broken died to self when you hear people talking when you hear people singing when you hear people ministering you could detect how broken the vessel has been only a vessel that has been through the cross can taste the resurrection power and to the proportion that we taste the cross to the exact proportion will we taste the resurrection power that is why Paul says oh that I may know him and the power of his resurrection but don't forget he didn't finish the sentence and the fellowship of his suffering there is no crown without a cross there is no resurrection power without crucifixion life so every time when I hear someone sing or someone lead a song someone minister straight away you could pick up has this vessel been broken only broken vessels contract vessels that have been crushed crushed and crushed under the experience of the cross can bring forth the resurrection life of God so it's important for us that for the life of Christ to come out we must be vessels that have been broken under the cross under the cross when I meet men of God where I could very feel within my bones their experience that they have gone through of their cross see some preachers will hear especially some young ones sometimes they hear ah they haven't experienced much cross yet you could tell it even and uh, you could feel and only a certain measure of resurrection life coming but you could feel there are areas that are not dead yet but when I meet some of these men of God and there are some very precious men of God who have gone through crucifixion and death of self they are most precious I love to be around them I love to draw from them only the crucified life can bring the resurrected life so we must die to bring the power of God to reality and tonight as we go into prayer just stop thinking about self sometimes we say Lord what about all this for a moment think about God's will God's will I have my as I say I have my 16 points that I pray every day but from time to time just so that it doesn't become areas where I'm concerned about my life put them aside for a while and just sometimes for days in a row I would just pray one prayer that will be done on earth as it's done in heaven just meditate on that and pray and pray and say nothing about myself and then once in a while I feel that I still need it is it I need to do that to go back to it so that my soul is disciplined and directed to do God's will just for my soul to be directed and trained and disciplined but on and on we have to daily die to ourselves pick up the cross and walk with it and say thy will be done and not ours sometimes when I sense that I've been doing a lot of intercession for various and ministry I will put that aside for days and sometimes weeks and just concentrate on praying for other areas other other all over the earth the kingdom of God just praying for them most important is not our will but his will be done on earth as it's done in heaven let's pray Father we 
thank you for the life of Jesus. Most glorious life that was ever lived on this planet Earth. Even the fragrance of his life that he has lived reaches across these thousands of years to refresh us. Because he has loved us, we can love him. Because he has died for us, we can die for you. Father, we thank you that there's no one, no one like Jesus, no one so precious, no one so lovely, no one so giving, no one so kind like him. We could live a thousand years and die a thousand times for you. We could give our bodies to be born or we could give all our possessions to the very last breath and it cannot compare to what Jesus gave up in order to come and save us. Of this whole universe, if there's anyone that has given the most, it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Father, we cannot fully, even now, comprehend His love. But we ask, O oh God, that as we enter Your presence tonight in prayer, that You help us to understand at least a portion of His love. that will make us and cause us to be willing to think about others and not ourselves to live for others and not for ourselves to give our life for others and not for ourselves Oh Father reveal to us a fellowship of His suffering as well as the power of His resurrection to us tonight. We ask Your grace to be poured forth. And we promise, Father, to always give You the worship, to always give You the glory, to always give You the honor in all that You do. Do it tonight, Lord. Let there be new realms of breakthrough like it's never done before. Let there be a reaching to the depth of emptiness of self and fullness of Christ like they have never reached before. Let us taste, Lord, the experience of Christ interceding through us tonight. Let us taste of His high priestly ministry tonight to be a part of praying the will of God on this earth tonight. Glorify your God once again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together to put our hearts in prayer. Jesus, 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 your love has melted my heart. Your love has melted